Yet we're continuing in our story of uh, Joseph, and last time we very much saw the rags to riches part of the story, where Joseph was taken for that, from that Egyptian dungeon, and uh, where he'd been put falsely accused of rape, and uh, effectively he was raised up to be Prime Minister of Egypt, dealing with the national and international famine crisis that uh, had come. And uh, God raised up Joseph as a deliverer and rescuer of the nations. And of course, that reminds us and speaks to us about Jesus, doesn't it? Uh, Vicky was talking about that rescue plan. And that's very much the theme of my sermon today, the rescue plan of God. Just as Joseph was raised up, so Jesus was raised up as a saviour of the world, as a rescuer of the nations. There's a reminder, there's Joseph and there's Jesus. One points to the other. And uh, the story of Joseph it is part of God's big story, of his big plan for bringing together of lost, fallen humanity, bringing together lost, fallen humanity with God Almighty, the father of mankind through God's plan of salvation. And the story of Joseph is the story of salvation. Salvation for the world and reconciliation, or making up with God. And and this theme of reconciliation now becomes the main focus of the story of of Joseph. God had been been at work through Joseph's family for, for, for many years, particularly starting with Abraham. And then Abraham's promised son, Isaac. And then from Isaac came Jacob, who was renamed Israel, if you remember. And Jacob had 12 sons, one of whom was Joseph. So he was in the line of that chosen family. But let's face it, the family was pretty messed up. It wasn't a saintly family from that point of view. In fact, it was a very, very ordinary family in that they were dysfunctional at times. They lied, they cheated, there was sexual immorality, there was violence. There was all sorts of things going on in the family. And, but God continued to work through that family, his plans and his purposes. He never, he never deviated from his plans and purposes, but he was working through that family. And we see it especially in the life of of Joseph. Joseph was his father's favourite. We know that from the multicoloured coat and the musical. Not that he wrote the musical, but (laughs) the young man who had dreams that his family would bow down to him, you remember? And, uh, And then his brothers got jealous and angry and they sold Joseph into slavery. And, uh, Uh, He ended up a slave and a head of a household, working in the household, but got wrongly accused of rape and imprisoned. There were more dreams that he was involved with. They weren't his dreams this time, but he was forgotten about again. But finally, Pharaoh had some dreams, and someone remembered Joseph and said, there's a man who knows about dreams. (laughs) Call him up. So Joseph was called up from the prison. Um, He had to wash and make himself clean and put on decent clothes because it was a filthy prison and he was brought before Pharaoh and uh, the result was that Pharaoh put him in charge of all Egypt and he helped to save the then known world. So God, we could say, had planned that Joseph would be in Egypt. It was far from Joseph's plan. It was never Joseph's plan to basically be thrown in a pit be sold as a slave, be falsely accused of rape, be forgotten about in a dungeon in a foreign land called Egypt who were the enemies of God's people. That was never Joseph's plan. But it was God's plan. It was was God's plan. And God had sent Joseph into Egypt for a reason. To keep alive many people. To rescue and literally save from starvation many people. Now, Pete will pick this up more next week, I know. But Genesis Genesis 45 and verses 7 to 8 says this. But God, this is Joseph speaking, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, he's talking to the brothers at this point, the ones who had sold him. It was not you who sent me here. It was God. It was God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. This was all in God's 
great plan. And in the same way, God sent Jesus to us here on earth to bring about a great deliverance for each and every one who will turn to him and receive his free gift of forgiveness and new life and being set free from the famine in our own lives. Do you remember last time we talked about how there can be famine in our own lives? It's not always about food. But there can be famine of hope, famine of, of, uh, a famine of love, famine of grace, when, we, when all we know is despair and fear. And when we feel trapped, that's a famine that we need deliverance from. So, we're coming now to chapters 42 to 44. And uh, that's the next section of Joseph's story. And I'm just going to summarise chapters 42 and 43, and then we'll look in more detail at chapter 44. Um, the writer, Dave Smith, in his book on uh, the life of Joseph, says this of these chapters. As one who had been greatly sinned against, Joseph now took the initiative and unconditionally released grace to his brothers. In doing so, he is a fitting example of all true followers of the living God, as Jesus himself stated. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won over your brother. And that's from Matthew 18. And this is what is happening in these three chapters. Joseph is winning over his brothers. He's the one who's been sinned against, in fact. He's the one who was sold by them, who was treated very badly by them, and he's now trying to win over his brothers, even though he's the one who's sinned, uh, who's sins against, who's been sinned against. That's a lesson for us, isn't it? Even if we are sinned against, it's still our responsibility to try and win over others yeah. to us. We take the initiative. And in chapters 42 and 43... <coughs> we see how, because of the famine, Joseph's brothers have been forced to travel to Egypt to buy grain. Egypt was the only place where there was grain. And jo when they come to Egypt, Joseph immediately recognises them, but doesn't show that he knows them. And the brothers have no idea that it's Joseph, the one they had abused and sold as a slave for money. And on this first trip, Benjamin is not with them. And Joseph particularly wanted to see Benjamin. Now, you might want to ask, well, why would Joseph be worried about Benjamin? Well, actually, Benjamin is the only one of the brothers who's his actual blood brother. The others are all stepbrothers. And just as the brothers abused Joseph, Joseph could be forgiven for thinking, I wonder how they're treating Benjamin. Are they also abusing Benjamin, my blood brother? So he was very concerned about Benjamin. And uh, they get grain from Joseph. They get grain actually freely given, completely free. But they have to leave Simeon behind as a kind of hostage. And they return home to Jacob, um, but without uh, out, uh, Simeon. And, uh, but after the grain runs out, they have to return back to Egypt once more. And this time they must take Benjamin with them. Because Joseph had made it very clear, if you come back, you must bring Benjamin, otherwise there'll be trouble, basically. So this time they come with Benjamin, and Joseph invites them into his home, treating them as honoured guests, carefully seating them in exact age order. He, of course, he knew the correct order. They still didn't know it was Joseph, so they were amazed that he knew so much about them. Uh, and actual fact, that would have been... Um, a way in those sort of cultures, those more Middle Eastern cultures, to honour guests would be to seat people in age order. When we were in Tajikistan, living and working there, um, that's what happened. If you went to a Tajik house uh, as a group of people, you were sat in exact age order, with the oldest person was at the head of the table facing the door, and the youngest person was by the door, and usually had to fetch and carry the tea. <laughs> and it was exact age, or that's how you honoured people. Everybody knew exactly people's age. Even if there was only a few days difference, you still had to sit in the right order. <laughs> Something like that was going on here in Egypt. And uh, there they are, uh, making merry with Joseph, not realising it's Joseph at all. And that's the situation we come to in the next chapter. The brothers still not knowing who their host actually is. Joseph is clearly testing them. 
I think he's treading quite carefully and slowly. I'm sure he wants to be reconciled with his brothers, and he wants to see his father. But he's also worried that things might go horribly wrong when he tells them who he is. So he's treading actually quite carefully. He wants to win them, but he's not being rash. Do you remember the Joseph, the rash young man who had a dream and blurted it out and upset everyone? He's learned a lot. He's now treading much more carefully. So we're coming to Genesis 44. And uh, the brothers set off. They had more grain. But Joseph has arranged a test for them to see how they would react, how they would react when they get falsely accused, this time of stealing a silver cup. In particular, when Benjamin is accused, because the cup has been secretly put in Benjamin's sack. How would they treat Joseph's true blood brother? So we're going to read part of the story now from Genesis 44. And uh, we're going to read from verse 3. It's a good story, this, so forgive that it's a little bit long, but uh, it's, it's worth reading. So, here we go. As morning dawned, the men were sent on their way with their donkeys. They'd not gone far from the city when Joseph said to his steward, Go after those men at once, and when you catch up with them, say to them, Why have you repaid good with evil? Isn't this the cup my master drinks from and also uses for divination? This is a wicked thing you have done. When he caught up with them, he repeated these words to them. But they said to him, Why does my Lord say such things? Far be it from your servants to do anything like that. We even brought back to you from the land of Canaan the silver we found inside the mouths of our sacks. Talking about last time when they went. So why would we steal silver or gold from your master's house? If any of your servants is found to have it, he will die and the rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. Very well then, he said, let it be as you say. Whoever is found to have it will become my slave. The rest of you will be free from blame. Each of them quickly lowered his sack to the ground and opened it. Then the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. At this they tore their clothes. Then they all loaded their donkeys and returned to the city. Joseph was still in the house when Judah and his brothers came in. And they threw themselves to the ground before him. Joseph said to them, what is this you have done? Don't you know that a man like me can find things out by divination? What can we say to my Lord? Judah replied. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. We are now my Lord's slaves. We ourselves and the one who was found to have the cup. But Joseph said, far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the man who was found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you, go back to your father in peace. Then Judah went up to him and said, please, my Lord, let your servant speak a word to my Lord. Do not be angry with your servant, though you are equal to Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servants, do you have a father or a brother? And we answered, we have an aged father, and there is a young son born to him in his old age. His brother is dead, and he is the only one of his mother's sons left, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me so I can see him for myself. And we said to my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father. If he leaves him, his father will die. But you told your servants... Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him what my Lord had said. I'll just skip to verse 30. So now, if the boy is not with us, when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servants will bring the grey head of your father down to the grave in sorrow. Your servant guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy. And let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father. It's a very moving story, isn't it? And uh, next week it gets even more moving as we come to the, the climax. But for now, what can we learn from this? 
Well, in the previous chapters, when the brothers first met Jesus, Joseph, Joseph, they kept saying, we are honest men. Several times they proclaimed something like, we are innocent, we are honest men. Clearly they were not honest men at all. <laughs> We've seen from their life how they plotted to kill and lie and cheat and they were immoral and they dishonoured their father and they argued and they were full of jealousy. They were not honest good men, despite what they were saying. But in this chapter, we see a surprising and inspiring and challenging transformation in at least one of the brothers, particularly in Judah's heart and attitude. Remember, Judah was the one who callously suggested selling Joseph as a slave. He was the one who was involved in that very sordid chapter that we looked at briefly of sexual immorality and prostitution and selfish, cruel scheming. I mean, it was a terrible story that Joe, Judah was involved in. He, he, he'd shown those immoral traits right the way through his life. That's the sort of person he was. But now we find him saying in verse 16, how can we clear ourselves? God has found out our guilt. Or as one translation puts it, our guilt has been uncovered. There's a change going on, isn't there, in Judah's life. He's finally come to realise his own sin and guilt. His own wrongdoing and wrong attitudes. And there's no, he's realised also there's nothing he can do about it himself. What an important place to come to. God has so worked in his circumstances and his life and the life of those around him to bring him to the point of realising that he desperately needs help and forgiveness and salvation. And God still does that sort of thing today. You know, sadly, sometimes the reason some people get so low in such desperate situations whether it's relationally or with addictions or financially or mentally, is because it takes that kind of thing for God to get through to them. Yeah. Sometimes that is the way God works. Not always, but sometimes that is the case. And later, Joseph intercedes before jo Later, Judah intercedes before Joseph. And Judah demonstrates his concerns for his father and for his half-brother Benjamin even offering to be a substitute for him and take the punishment in his place from Joseph. He's actually beginning to demonstrate fruits of repentance, a changed life. He's beginning to be kind and unselfish and honest and concerned for the well-being of other people, not just himself, particularly his father and his younger brother. That's quite a transformation to be going on in someone's life, isn't it? How's this come about? Well, Judah has realised that God knew what he was really like. And that in all that was happening in his life, God was doing something. He was realising that God was already involved in his life. And it's the same for us. God is in charge over the affairs of men and women. That includes you and I. The Bible talks about how we are fearfully and wonderfully made in his image, knit together in the womb, and he knows our thoughts, and he knows our comings, and he knows our goings, and he knows our ways. And we need to realise that. The psalmist, David, says this in Psalm 139. I'm just going to read you the first 12 verses. Listen to these, these verses. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. That, could have been, that was said by David, 
in his life. It could have been said by Judah at this point. He'd come to realise this was true. And it could be said by us. In fact, it should be said by us because it's true. <laughs> All those words are true for us as well. And Judah is recognising that God knows everything and has plans and purposes for him. And God knows all about your life. And he doesn't throw up his arms in horror and run a mile and say, oh my goodness, what a lot. <laughs> he says, I love you and I'm going to work in your life. And I love to see that transformation happening in your life as well as you allow me to work in your life. God knows you. He sees you. He understands you. He knows the good, the bad and the ugly. <laughs> There's good news there. There's challenging news there. Yes, I know. There is. But it's out of love and out of grace that he knows you. Secondly, I believe that it was God's kindness that led Judah to a place of repentance. Joseph had consistently shown fairness and justice and kindness and grace to his brothers. He gave them grain and didn't charge them for it. He invited them into his house. He prepared a banquet for them. He treated them with, like honoured guests. He asked after their father, which was another sign of great honour in society, to ask after the, the elderly relatives in, uh, in the family. He treated them so well. Isn't that the way God treats us? Yeah. Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, God's kindness leads you towards repentance. God's kindness leads you towards repentance. Joseph was kind, and we can be kind to one another, can't we? <laughs> it's a good thing to do, but we can be kind out in the community. Kindness can lead people to repentance when God is involved. Yes, we need the word of God, yes, we need the truth, but we also need God's kindness and his love. It was God's kindness that led me to repentance and faith as I uh, became a Christian, but I really didn't know what it meant to follow Jesus at all until I met the church that, that I became part of. And they were so kind to me. I'd never had people actually show an interest in me. I'd never had people give me a hug, people who I didn't know. I'd never had people actually ask how I'm doing and invite me to their homes. And it led me to a place to say, OK, God, I know I'm a Christian. Now I really want to follow you. <laughs> now I want to turn from my sin. Now I want to turn from messing about. Now I want to follow you and give my life to you. And it's the same for many here, I know. They understand their love by God. They find a love and acceptance in God's people. God, always out of kindness, leads us to repentance. And repentance is a friend who will never leave us until we see Jesus face to face. There will always be those times when we need to repent. But if God has led us to that time, it's out of his kindness. Thirdly, this turning, this repentant attitude, is a work of the Holy Spirit. John 16 verse 8 says, And when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit brings a conviction of sin and an understanding and a knowledge of the horror of sin. We don't think about that with the Holy Spirit very often, do we? We think of the Holy Spirit, oh, he gives us gifts, he gives us tongues, he helps us to prophesy, he helps us to have lively worship, he gives us words to say. He convicts of sin. <laughs> That's what Jesus said, the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. It's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit. He helps us to understand how sin corrupts us, how sin corrupts individuals and families, and how sin is corrupt in the world. And we see it in this story of Joseph's family, and we see it in the, in the world today. So the Holy Spirit is at work when repentance is happening. <laughs> That's one of the works of the Holy Spirit. So we see how Judah was transformed as God's kindness led him to repentance from his sin and he realised he was uncovered before God and man. And the Holy Spirit brought a conviction to his life. I believe the Holy Spirit was at working in Judah's life, was working in Judah's life. He knew he now needed the grace and forgiveness of a saviour. Joseph was standing in front of him as a potential saviour. We have one greater than Joseph standing yeah. for us, yeah. who we come to. And Judah came to understand that the only way forward was a substitution, himself for Benjamin. Only in that way could he and his family 
be saved. Well, doesn't that point to Jesus yes. so clearly? What was true for Judah when he said in verse 16, how can we clear ourselves is also true of us. Yeah. How? How can, we, how can we make ourselves right? How can we clean ourselves? Has anybody got any ideas? There's only one idea. There's only one way. We need someone to stand for us, to stand in the gap for us, to be a mediator, a substitute, someone who will take the punishment for us, who will settle our accounts with God, who will pay the price for that. Is there anyone like that? There is. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 to 6 says this. For there is one God and there is one mediator someone who stands for us in the middle between God and men the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all which is the testimony given at the proper time and just before those verses it says God desires that all people be saved and it's through this is there anyone who can be a substitute a deliverer a rescue a rescuer a saviour for us is there anyone Yes, you could answer me. Yes, there is. You know. I know you know. There is. There's one called Jesus. He's the only one, a perfect sacrifice, who can satisfy the holiness of God. As he gave himself on the cross to die in our place. That was the substitution we need to make us right with God. Wow. Wow. So what can we learn from Judah and Joseph? Well, it doesn't matter what sort of person we were, what our background is, even our religious or our cultural background, God still shows his grace and kindness to us, inviting us to come to him, inviting us to receive a transformed life. But we do need to understand and recognise and take responsibility for who we are. Dark, black in nature, wrong, living far from God, doing things our way, selfishly looking after number one. God's kindness leads us to repentance and the Holy Spirit will come and show us our need of repentance. And we need to accept that Jesus died in our place as a substitute, taking the punishment for our sin, for us being sinful by nature. He's the only mediator before God and man. Just like Judah stood there and he thought, there's only one way we're going to get out of this. That is if I become a substitute for Benjamin. That could save my family, possibly. And we'll see what happens next week when Pete preaches. <laughs> There's only one person who can save you and your family and your friends and our neighbours and this community. And that is Jesus. And how do we come to salvation? By believing by faith in his name. We're justified, we're made right, we're brought into right relationship with God by faith in Jesus and his dying for us on the cross. That's how we live our lives and how the lives of others are transformed and how our own lives are transformed. It's the only way, there is no other way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's so good to be reminded of the gospel. Who knew when we started the story of Joseph that we would end up with such a gospel rescue plan? Hallelujah. And it gets better next week as well. (laughs) Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's pray.